How many of you feel like we've been in the book of Acts forever? Nobody's raising their hand. Okay, well, I do. Today we are going to cover five chapters. Hold on carefully because we have a lot to cover and I'm going to do it fairly rapid fire. One to start in Acts chapter 1 verse 1. You go all the way back to the beginning. I want to remind you what Acts was about. Luke, Dr. Luke, who eventually became companion of Paul. And we will find him traveling to Rome with Paul. Writes this, I wrote the first narrative. What first narrative? The gospel of Luke. I wrote the first narrative Theophilus, that's who he's writing to. He was writing to an individual. About all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up, after he had given orders through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After he had suffered, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during the 40 days and speaking the king about the kingdom of God. Luke is saying this is a continuation of the story that I started in the gospel, and it's written to this man so that he may understand what Jesus had done and what the continuing effects of Christ working through his apostles was and about the sacrifices that they were willing to make. I remind you of this phrase, this saying from Jim Elliot that we gave you last week where Elliot wrote in his diary shortly before he died at the hands of the tribe in South America. He said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. How many of you will live physically in this body forever? Not one. Can you keep this life No. So to give up this life, to gain what you cannot lose, is not a big sacrifice. Because we know that there's something after that we will be with Christ. Amen? He gave his life to reach those that tribe. And today there is a thriving community of Christians there. And they can never lose what they have gained because of Jim Elliot's sacrifice to bring to them what Christ did for them on the cross. First Corinthians 15 says, I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. You know, if you listen to most people give the gospel, they will say something very simply, Jesus died for you. Amen? And is that true? Yeah, absolutely. We're going to find today that Paul said there's something very much more important that needs to be included in what we say. And here Paul says, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And then he goes on and gives the evidence of the resurrection. I want you to pay attention to the number of times Paul says, I'm being persecuted, I'm being tried, I am here in front of judges, in front of kings for the hope of the resurrection. There are two warring factions in the Jewish community at the time of Paul. Paul was a, anybody know? A Pharisee, right? Who believed in the letter of the law and added a lot of rules to it, but they also believed in angels and they believed in the resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees, and you should know what the Sadducees were sad because of, because they were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection, nor did they believe in the spirit world. 
So they treated the body as something evil, something to get rid of, something to be done with, and there would, in their minds, never be a resurrection. So if there is no resurrection, there could not be a resurrection for Jesus. And if there is not a resurrection for Jesus, there's certainly not a resurrection for us. This is an important distinction that comes again and again through the book of Acts and also through the rest of the New Testament. We have found Paul on his way to Rome. He started back to Jerusalem, intent to go back to Jerusalem. And there's the First Corinthians passage. Intent to go back to Jerusalem because he believed that God had something for him and he knew there was going to be consequences. He was confronted with them over and over and over again. If you go there, you're going to be in, bound in chains. If you go there, there's, there's pain waiting for you. And Paul said, I'm going anyway because God told me I need to go. He went down to the temple to fulfill a vow to try to show the Jewish people that he re still respected the law. And there he was arrested because they tried to kill him. So they arrested him to find out why they were trying to kill him. And Paul, we ended with Paul claiming his Roman citizenship so that they didn't beat him, beat, literally beat the truth out of him. You've heard that phrase? I'm going to beat the truth out of him. That's what they were going to do. He claimed his Roman citizenship and they stopped. <clears throat> Acts chapter 23, verse 11. The following night, the Lord stood by him after he had been arrested and said, have courage. Have courage. Paul was in a place again. He was in prison. He had done nothing wrong again. He was facing potential execution again. He had already been stoned and left for dead, imprisoned in Philippi. And the Holy Spirit says, have courage for as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. I have a plan for you. I have something you must do you are going to stand before Caesar's household and Caesar himself and testify about Jesus. Paul had been brought before the Sanhedrin in the end of chapter 22. And at the Sanhedrin, he began to speak and uh, the high priest ordered him struck smack him, and he uh, said some pretty strong words. I want you to notice this, because it's important. I, he said in verse 1 of chapter 23, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good consciousness till this day. But the high priest Ananias ordered those who were standing next to him to strike him on the mouth. Paul didn't realize it was the high priest. So Paul said this, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. That was pretty strong words. They would whitewash around the entrance of tombs because the Pharisees wanted to be able to see where the tombs were clearly because if they were to get too close to the tombs, they would be ceremonially unclean to go into the temple. And so when you see, when you hear the term whitewashed sepulcher, it's making something that's full of corruption pretty on the outside so it can be viewed easily. Okay? He's calling these people that. And they answered, there you revile the high priest. And Paul immediately repented when he realized it was the high priest. Notice what he said, I, do not, I did not know that it was the high priest for it is written, you must not speak evil of a ruler of your people. You know, my friends, we got to be careful. 
there's times when we don't like what our governor or our president is doing or says or and, and I'll be honest, I don't like it. Amen. We we will disagree with things they do. But we've got to be careful what we say. Because we're not to be speaking evil about those that God has put in power in power. Who raised up Newsom? Who raised up Biden? Or if you go back, who raised up Trump or who raised up um, Obama and go so forth? It is God who sets up kings and God who takes them down, right? Be careful. I don't know that any of you do, but be careful. Don't speak evil against a ruler. <clears throat> Paul quickly ascertains that what's going on here is there there was Pharisees on one side and Sanhedrin uh, uh, on one side of the Sanhedrin and Sadducees on the other side. And notice what he says in verse 6. This is part of the theme of this morning. Brothers, I am a Pharisee, son of Pharisees. I am being judged for what? For of the resurrection of the dead. And immediately a dispute set out. He set off a firestorm between these two rival factions. They no longer cared about Paul. They were going to argue the doctrinal fine points. No, there's not resurrection. Yes, there is resurrection. And back and forth, it got so heated that the Roman centurion had to pull Paul out of there again and bring him back into safety. Verse 10, when the dispute became violent, the commander feared that Paul might be torn apart, ripped one way or the other. So he rescued him and took him back to the barracks. Well, the story of how evil these religious leaders were continues in chapter 23. Verse, 20, verse 12, when it was day, the Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves under a curse, neither to eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. Murder. In the name of religion, nothing new. But these are supposed to be God's people. These are supposed to be people of the book. And here they are conspiring to kill him. <laughs> My professor that I had for the book of Acts, we had all these fun, fun sayings for which chapters. And he, chapter 23, a thousand fleas. Basically was saying, may a thousand fleas infest my tent unless I, if I do not kill Paul by the end of the day. Putting themselves under a curse. It would eat nothing. Well, Paul had family in Jerusalem. And Paul's sister's son, his nephew, heard about the plot and came and told Paul about it. Paul told him to tell the Roman centurion. And the Roman centurion said, we're going to get Paul out of here tonight. Assembled the, the uh, guards. Um, if you look, um, verse 23, so he summoned the two centurions and said, get 200 soldiers, 70 cavalry, 200 spearmen. That's a lot of people to guard one man, right? They were going to make sure that Paul, a Roman citizen, was not killed by these rogue Jewish people who had put themselves under a curse and they took him to Caesarea. And I'm not... Okay, we're right there. So they went from... I can't use my pointer. They were in Jerusalem, right? And they went down to Caesarea, down the mountain to Caesarea where there was a palace of Herod the Great. And there he would be held and the charges against him could be brought by those that were making the charges. So they sent a letter, and the letter is included in chapter 23, what they said. And they took Paul by night, and there he is going to face Governor Felix. Now, I got to take you back, because we have Felix, and we have Festus, and we have Agrippa, and who are all these guys, and how do they fit into anything? So we're going to take you back to this chart 
and I'll, I'll give you some, some uh, what's the word I want? Um, I'll orient you a little bit. Herod the Great killed the babies in Bethlehem when Jesus was born, right? Sought Jesus' life. Herod the Great had, this is his family. These are his four wives. We have Herod Antipas, Herod Archelaus, Herod Philip, and Philip the Tetrarch. These, these all come into the stories of Herodias. So Herod Antipas is who had married Herodias and, and killed John the Baptist. All right. We also have Herod Agrippa. Herod Agrippa had Bernice, Herod Agrippa II, Felix, uh, or, and Drusilla. Drusilla married Felix. You following all that? Felix is who Paul was brought to. He later went before Herod Agrippa II later in these chapters that I'm going to be in. Festus is not just a character on Gunsmoke. Anybody watch Gunsmoke as a kid? Or do so Festus was the deputy. Festus was a Roman governor appointed outside of the Herod family. Okay? Appointed by, by Rome. So kind of get yourself oriented to who, who all these people were. Herod, the Herod family still held a lot of pull in Judea and the surrounding regions of Rome because of Herod the Great's influence. So, they come before, before Felix at Caesarea. The high priest comes and makes the accusation. And we're in chapter 24, verse 1 through 9. Uh, and after five days of Paul being down in Caesarea, the high priest and some elders and a lawyer named Tertullus came and presented their case. What did they say? Verse 5, we have found this man to be a plague. Boy, isn't that a nice word. An agitator among all the Jews of the Roman world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. None of that sounds very good. That wasn't a compliment to say he was a ringleader of the Nazarenes. This man is a harm to the Roman world because of these three things, being a plague and an agitator and a ringleader. And he tried to desecrate the temple. But they went on and accused the Roman centurion of harming justice as well. Verse 6, he even tried to desecrate the temple. So we apprehended him and wanted to judge him according to our law. Remember, it was a mob that was killing him. That's not justice. Amen? But the high priest, oh, no, 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 no. We, we were going to judge him according to our law. But the Roman centurion, Lysias, took him out of our hands with great force. How dare he? Right? And Lysias brought him here to make and made us come here to you instead of us dealing with this in Jerusalem. Paul defended himself again. Verse 10, all the way down through verse 21. And again, for time's sake, I'm not going to read it all. But Paul says, I wasn't dis disputing or reasoning with anyone anywhere. I was not doing that in the temple. I wasn't causing a ruckus in the temple. I was not doing it in the synagogues. I wasn't doing it in the city. No crowds had gathered around me. I was not preaching. I was not being disruptive. None of these charges are true. And they have no evidence. Then in verse 14, he says this. But I confess this to you. I worship my father's God according to the way. It's what they had called the sect of the Nazarenes. They, Paul is calling the way, which they call a sect. Believing all things are written, all things 
that all things are written in the law and the prophets. I have hope, a hope in God, which these men themselves also accept, that there is going to be a resurrection. We come back to the same theme, don't we? Paul here is saying this is about the hope of the resurrection. My friends, if we miss telling people about the hope of the resurrection, we've missed the point. We've missed it. Because if there is no hope for our resurrection, then Jesus didn't raise either. And if Jesus didn't raise, we all might as well go home because God's not in this because his book said it not, he did. So Paul, once again, claims that this is about the resurrection. Paul, verse 19, claims for specific charges. Let them come. Let the ones that were beating me up in the temple come and tell me what I've done. Let them answer the charged that I'm being charged according to the hope of the res- judged according to the judged concerning the hope of the resurrection. My apologies, Samantha. I did, that didn't come out well. Well, Felix, again, Felix married Drusilla, which is daughter of Agrippa, who is grandson of Herod the Great. You got it? Felix was accurately informed about the way. Felix had his finger on the pulse of what was going on in the land. And he says, when uh, Lysias comes down, I will decide your case. And he ordered the centurion there to keep Paul under guard. Felix came with his wife, Drusilla. Remember who Drusilla is. By the way, Drusilla, um, I have it here someplace. Yeah. Oh, no, that's Bernice. We'll come back to Bernice in a minute. Drusilla is that, uh, they, they all had multiple husbands and and intermarrying within the family it was all really strange herod's family is really bizarre if you start studying it out it's rather sick but let's move on felix kind of left him in prison saying i when i when i'm ready i will call for you paul had uh, paul had talked to him about about faith in jesus christ verse 24 we're still in chapter 24 verse 24. But I want you to notice something. Let's go back to verse 24 of chapter 24. After some days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and listened to him on the subject of faith in Jesus Christ. Now, as he spoke about three things, righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Felix became afraid and replied, leave for now, but when I find time, I'll call for you. It appears that Felix became afraid when Paul began to talk about the judgment to come. Fear filled him and he didn't want to hear about it. My, fo- my friends, Christ died for your sins. Sins means there must be judgment. If we leave the, resurre- the hope of the resurrection out, the hope means nothing if there's not a judgment that we're being saved from. Amen? A lot of preachers today, not part of our circles, want to pretend that this is just about living well and being blessed and, and uh, having, having good health and having lots of money because God wants to bless you. As an unbeliever, God has one choice because of his righteousness and that is judgment. There is no other choice for God outside of payment of that sin And there's only two ways that sin can be paid for. One is you pay for it yourself, amen? That's an eternity in the lake of fire. That's how much it costs. 
The other is that Jesus pays it for you. And he paid it on the cross. And all we have to do is believe. Paul said that to the Philippian jailer. What must I do to be saved? The Philippian jailer asked. And Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith in him. And God counts it for righteousness. Felix heard about the judgment to come and got rather upset and didn't want to hear from Paul anymore. He heard about having to have self-control. By the way, that's a Christian virtue, amen? Self-control. Well, Felix um, is replaced in chapter 25. Paul's still there. I should have put up here the timeline. We're talking about several years. Many, many months going into years. After two years had passed, verse 27, Felix received a successor, Pontius, uh, Por- Por- Porcius Festus, and because he wished to do a favor for the Jews, Felix left Paul in prison. He never ruled on the case. Festus comes in, and the chief priests come down, and it goes starts all over again. They wanted to take him to back to Jerusalem. They wanted to ambush him on the way and Festus had nothing to do with it. So they kept him in Caesarea. Uh, Verse six, when he had spent more than 10 days, eight or 10 days among them, he went down to Caesarea. The next day seated on the judgment bench. So Festus had been in Jerusalem talking to the high priest, came down to Caesarea uh, and the Jews came down and argued their case. Paul, uh, verse 9, Festus, wanting to do a favor for the Jews, replied to Paul, are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and to be tried before me on these charges? Paul knew that to go back to Jerusalem meant death. And he knew that the Holy Spirit had said, "You you will stand before Rome in my name for me. So Paul's answer was, I appeal to Caesar. Every Roman citizen had the right for his case to be heard by Caesar. And when Caesar hears the case, there's uh, basically two verdicts. Freedom or death. You're either convicted and you die, or you're found innocent and you're set free. And it's all in the mood that the Caesar was in on that day. Especially uh, towards Christians. Festus was then visited by King Agrippa, chapter 26. Chapter 25, 13 through 26. Uh, Verse 13, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived in Caesarea. I want to go back to this. uh, Here it is, right here. So King Agrippa and Bernice. Bernice had been married to somebody else and is now connected somehow to Agrippa, her brother, And there is speculation, because nobody really knows for sure whether this was a romantic connection or she was just hanging around with her brother. So King Agrippa comes to Caesarea because it's a nice, cool place and Grandpa's palace is right there on the water and it's gorgeous and it's relaxing. And uh, Festus says, why don't you listen to Paul? Festus is visited by Agrippa and Bernice. Agrippa means hero-like. Bernice means bring victory. These two are an interesting couple indeed. King Agrippa was actually Herod Agrippa II, son of Herod Agrippa I, the Herod whom we read about in Acts 12, who ordered James killed and planned to do the same with Peter until God stepped in. His son, whom we read about here, is much more sympathetic character in the scripture record. Although he does refuse to accept Paul's message, Bernice was his sister. She was first married to Uncle Herod, who reigned over Chalichus. After his death, she married uh, Polemon, king of Sicily. She soon abandoned him and returned to her brother Agrippa. There is 
great suspicion about the exact nature of their relationship. The Bible, however, makes no accusation against them in this regard. It, indeed, it doesn't mention the matter one way or other. Bernice finally became, for a short time, the mistress of Emperor Titus. She's quite the lady. Quite the lady. So Festus gives his report to Agrippa. Agrippa uh, listens to Paul, chapter 26, uh, verse 1 through 23. Agrippa says, is it permitted? It, it is permitted, or is it permitted for you to speak for yourself? Paul stretched out his hand and began his defense. I consider myself fortunate, King, King Agrippa, for today I'm going to make my defense before you. And once again, verse 9, I stand, I na and now I stand on trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers, the promise our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve him night and day, King Agrippa. What hope is he talking about? It's the hope of the resurrection once again. And what's Agrippa's response to this? He could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. He's innocent. All right. I'm going to cover the last few chapters very quickly. Paul is put on a ship to Rome. Verse 27. When it was decided that we were to sell to Italy, notice the pronoun change in this verse. It means Luke's back with them. It hasn't been to this point. Now Luke's back with him, traveling with him probably as his personal physician. Luke had not included himself, Wiersbe says, since Acts 21, verse 18. But now join Paul and Aristarchus for the voyage to Rome. It's possible Luke was allowed to go as Paul's personal physician, and Aristarchus is his personal attendant. How oh, Paul must have thanked God for faithful friends who gave up their liberty and even risked their lives that he might have the help needed. On this journey, Paul warns them about going at this time of year. It says they were um, leaving after the fast. Verse 9, Now much time had passed and the voyage was already dangerous since the fast was already over. The fast is referred to the Day of Atonement, which means they were in October on a sailing ship in the Mediterranean when the winds weren't going to be very cooperative. Well, the centurion decided to go anyway. Verse 9 indicates that time was a factor. Catch up. Here we go. The centurion decided to go anyway. He was impatient because too much time had already lapsed. He listened to the captain, got expert advice. I always get expert advice by talking to myself. But um, are you awake? I know this is a long message. He got expert advice from the captain. They did not have a suitable harbor to go into. The Bible goes through that. And then democracy. What do I mean? Verse 12. Since... The harbor was unsuitable to winter in. The majority decided to sail from there, hoping somehow to reach Phoenix, a harbor on Crete. So they took a vote. It was the wrong vote. They should have listened to Paul. Favorable wind. They, they set out, and there was a nice, gentle south wind, and they thought they had achieved their purpose. Verse 13. However, not long after, verse 14, a fierce wind called a nor'easter sprung up. There was a terrible storm. And they began to fight to save the ship. And much of chapter 27 is, re is talking about the fact that they were trying to find a good place to shelter. They, were, they lowered the drift anchors. Those were huge stones with holes cut in that they would drag behind the ship to help stabilize the ship. They started throwing over the cargo and the ship's gear. Verse 15. 
to try to save their lives. And Paul said, listen, verse 22 of chapter 27. I urge you to take courage because there will be no loss of any of your lives, but only the ship. For this night, an angel of God that I belong to and serve stood by me and said, don't be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar and look, God has graciously given you all those who are selling with you. Paul knew that there was going to be no loss of life. The ship ran aground on Malta. And on the shore of Malta, they built a fire to warm themselves by. And Paul was reaching in for some firewood and a serpent, a snake bit him. And everybody thought he must be a terrible prisoner. He must be a murderer because he's been bitten by a snake. Paul shook it off. And then when he suffered no ill effects, they were watching him to see him swell up. Just waiting for him to swell up and die. And he didn't. Okay, then they thought, well, he must be a god. Verse 6 of chapter 28. While he was there, Paul healed the father-in-law of a very, very important man, Publius, of the diseases that he was on. He also healed many of those on the island. Paul spread the gospel to them, telling them the saving work that he had been sent to the Gentiles. He stayed there three months. At last at Rome, Paul meets with the Jewish leaders, explains to them why he was there. Others were, some were persuaded, others were not. And he said this, God's saving work has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen even when you haven't. And rather abruptly, Luke ends the book of Acts in verse 30 of chapter 28. Then he stayed two whole years in his own rented house and welcomed all who visited him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching the things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with full boldness and without hindrance. And that ends the book of Acts. Luke doesn't tell us about him going before Caesar. Luke doesn't tell us about him being released and then re-imprisoned and finally executed. Luke does not tell us about his time in the Mamertine prison on his second imprisonment. All these things we have to discover from history because at the point in time that Luke finished his letter to Theophilus and said, it's time to mail this. Paul was in a rented home with a guard and he was able to send and receive visitors and he was able to share the gospel. In fact, we know that many of Caesar's own guard came to Christ because God had put Paul there. Why? Because of the hope of the resurrection. He was charged because he believed in the resurrection by the Sadducees. And God used that. And Paul fearlessly, fearlessly went. Why could Paul be fearless? Because there is no fear in death. If Paul were to live, that's Christ. If Paul were to die, that's gain. There is no fear in death. We do not need to fear what man can do to me. What can man do but take my life? Isn't that very much the attitude that Jim Elliot had going to South America? What can they do to me short of taking my life? Talitha, let your mom know that I'm a lost dog. What can man do? If we have no fear, does that embolden us to share the gospel? Yes. Why? Because we have the hope of the resurrection. It lies in the hope of the resurrection. And if we're not solid on the resurrection, we cannot be solid in our boldness. Because we're going to fear what people think. We're going to fear what people might do. We're going to fear losing our life, losing our friendships, anything else. But my friends, we have this hope. 
we must embrace it. And we must say with Jim Elliot, he is no fool who gives what he cannot lose to gain, gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. That should be the theme of our life. Father God, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you that Dr. Luke set about to inform us more perfectly about the actions of the early apostles in the early church. May you be glorified in our lives as we, with boldness, share the gospel with others. In Jesus' name, amen.